Um, so we talked about what is marriage. Now what I want you to do is have a conversation at your table about what's the purpose of marriage. Why are we doing it? So before it was what. Now what I want you to talk about is why. Why are we married? What's the purpose? Go. What's the purpose? Why are we doing this thing called marriage? Good. Tell me what you mean by disciple. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, good job. Pull out potential, it's good. Good job, whoever said that. <laughs> good. We're going to talk about this afternoon, um, a guy named Salvador Mnuchin. He's a, he's a pioneer of family therapy, and he is really, it's really cool stuff about in regards to stability for, for kiddos and those kinds of things. Yes, yeah, so you guys are pretty much right on track. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, as Christians... Um, I think our marriages should be countercultural. Um, they should look different. Um, if you do not see that your marriage looks different, if you are falling in line, right? So maybe um, we have lots of opposite sex friendships and we don't think there's anything wrong with that. And we talk about our sex life to everybody and we just share all of our deepest intimate marital issues with whomever is interested in hearing. Um, that's not countercultural. So when we think about the actual purpose of marriage, what we're talking about is something that is very, very oppositional to the majority. Um, especially, um, in the 21st century right now, I'm a firm believer. And this is part of what put my wife and I down the ministry field that we're in as far as marital therapy. Um, I think a vast, I can't say everything, but I think a very large majority of the issues that we see culturally and politically would be solved if marriages got better. If marriages started to live the way they were supposed to be lived in a countercultural way, children would be affected and lots of the issues that we see would resolve themselves. It's my personal belief. And so my wife and I kind of agree on that. We don't kind of, we do agree on that. And that's what kind of jumped us off into this ministry because our marriages should be doing something that reflects something different than what we see around us. And so the question you probably are asking yourself or maybe should be or could be asking yourself is, does our marriage... Do we look like that? Are we being the countercultural example? Um, there's a book, you're probably fairly familiar with it. It's called The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller. Uh, it's maybe the single best marriage book ever in regards to the actual purpose of marriage. Clients ask me this all the time. Do you have any, do you have any resources? You'll see my marital resources are very small. <laughs> That's on purpose. There's a lot of bad information out there. A lot. But Tim Keller's book is one of the most sensational books. And he talks about how marriage has essentially three intentions. And the first is transformation. And when he talks about transformation, what he's talking about is there should be a changing of me as the individual in the context of the marriage. If I live my whole marriage the same, if there's never any friction, if there's never any changing of me as a person, I'm probably not doing it counterculturally. I'm probably not doing it the way that God intended it to be done. There's something that actually takes place. There's a transformation that takes place in the context of the marriage that does not happen anywhere else. The other thing that marriage does or is supposed to do or why we're married is a sanctification, which is a purification process. It's 
Getting rid of the bad. That is sanctification. But in order to get rid of the bad, we sometimes have to find it, address it, and then do something about it. And that's the hard part, which we're going to talk about in this next section after this, talking about the purpose. We're going to talk about what do we do? How do we do it? And Tim Keller talks about how that requires a lot of humility. If I'm going to be purified and transformed, i got to be real honest about myself and about what's going on in the marriage that might be toxic or unhealthy or unhelpful. The last thing that he talks about is that it's how the intention, the purpose of marriage is growth or to be stretched, to be grown into something different. Now, if you look at these things, transformation, sanctification, and growth, very different than have fun, be best friends, hang out, have sex whenever I want. Very different, very countercultural, right? It contradicts a lot of those kinds of things. It also looks very painful. <laughs> I don't know about you, um, but being purified, sanctified, and stretched, probably not going to be most comfortable 100% of the time, right? I have a therapist that I work with. She talks about how marriage itself is the testing ground to become like Christ. Right? There's another book um, uh, that talks about how marriage is not to make us happy, it's to make us holy. And to become holy, we're probably not going to be happy all the time. I hear this all the time from couples, we just want to be happy. I'm like, great, that's a third of your marriage. There's two-thirds of the marriage that are going to require you to become something different. You become something that you could not have become otherwise in the context of your marriage. And if we're living it right, what, that, what marriage is supposed to do is to turn us into becoming like Jesus. Because it's intimate. You should be closer to your spouse than, your, than anybody else that you experience in your lives. So, <clears throat> this is my wife on our wedding day. Um, we got married in 2010. Uh, we actually got married her, at the hideaway location here in Texas. Um, we actually had a, a little private ceremony there. Um, this was her on our wedding day. She didn't know I was putting these pictures up, by the way. <laughs> Um, but this is her. Um, she was stunning, as most brides are on that day. Um, everything that she had ever envisioned as far as what a wedding would look like, um, she got to live out and kind of walk out for herself, which is a really cool thing. Her parents facilitated that. Um, but a lot of times when we get married, married, we think that the purpose is the wedding. This happens for some marriages. We get so excited about the idea of the marriage, um, that we get, or the wedding, that we get lost in the ideas of the marriage. But this was her on that day. This is me. Um, we were, it, it was one of the most incredible days that, in our entire lives. And I put this picture up here because we got married on the rim of the canyon. Um, we lit candles and they didn't go out all night in Texas in, in September. It was like this just perfect night. Like there was no wind. There was nothing about it that um, affected anything. It was just really a sensational evening. Um, and it was weird because, like, we stood on that room of that canyon, um, and she was her, and I was me, and we said these vows, right? And we all know the scripture, right? You shall leave your father and your mother, and you should become what? One flesh. Like, you should become one. And it was a really cool thing because um, the day before, or the week before we got married, my father-in-law, he said, hey, do you have a plan for your wedding night? I said, uh, Yes. <laughs> Um, and he said, no, he said, do you know what you're going to do on the night that you get married? And I was like, well, I think I've got some things figured out as far he was talking about where we were staying, not where we were. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, I've got, we've got an idea. If you'll just trust me with that night, we'll take care of it. And I was like, sure, absolutely. Um, and so the day before our wedding, my brother said, Hey, can I grab your car keys? And I was like, sure. And uh, then my car disappeared. I was like, what the crap? And after we got married, we walk, you know, you walk through, I think we had sparklers, like you walk through the sparklers and we get in the back of this suburban, but the windows are all blacked out. Like we couldn't see anything. And our families like rush the car and they throw in like a couple of bottles of wine and some grapes and cheese. And they said, have so much fun. We'll see you when you get back from your honeymoon. We were like, what is happening? Like what's going on? And we drive for about 40 minutes and the door of the suburban opens and there's a jet. We're at a private airline and there's a jet and a pilot sitting there. We were like, What? And so we get on the plane and wheels up, we fly to Santa Fe and we land at the airport and there's my car. (laughs) And it was like, what the heck is happening? So our whole family had arranged for us to take this private jet on the night. We weren't going to get to go until the next day, but it was true. Like truly like that's, you don't even read about that stuff usually. 
We actually got to walk it out. But here's the deal, is we had heard all this time that we shall leave our father and our mother and we should become one. So we were like, yeah, like, I'm not going to be me and you're not going to be you anymore. We're going to be this one thing. And then we landed in Santa Fe and we had our wedding night and then we woke up the next day and I, I was still me. And she was still her. There was something that got created that night that was a third entity. And part of what happens is there's me and there's you, but part of what gets created is this thing we call the us. And the us is what happens when you cut covenant. And this is a really interesting thing. I don't have all the facts, so don't quote me on any of this. But there are some traditions or marital traditions where the bride and the groom walk underneath this awning. And the awning has like cow's blood that drips from the awning. And the couple walks through and then is covered in the blood from all these different cows. And they walk out on the other side, having become one flesh. So it's supposed to symbolize that there's no longer me, there's no longer you, there's a joining. We can't really determine which is which, but there's this new thing between the two of us. And what happens in divorce is really interesting, is a divorce is if you took a piece of flesh and like pulled it apart. It's not like taking a scalpel, right? We're just gonna we're just gonna do this as amicably as possible. No, that's no. It doesn't happen. Because when that one flesh was created, when this us-ness came into being, it's like this whole new thing got created. And here's the deal. The us is the first child of the marriage. And so if I'm not taking care of the us, something's wrong. And here's what happens is the us needs its diaper changed. And the us gets hungry. And the us gets cranky. The us also makes decisions. The us also makes all kinds of decisions. And so it's no longer about me. It's no longer about her. It's about who we are together. Um, There's a therapy friend of mine who had another therapy friend who um, his wife died after like 65 years of marriage. And he said, God, are you going to like, how are you going to go on? Like, are you going to miss her? And obviously like, that's kind of a dumb question. But he said, I am going to miss her. But what I'm going to miss more is what we were together. And if we're in marriages, there is this other thing that gets created. And it's this us that is part of the intentionality of what marriage should be. Okay, so I need two volunteers. This is that moment. This is that moment. I don't care who it is, but somebody come see me. Two people. Right on. Oh, yeah, okay, we can do this. (laughs) I'm going with it. (laughs) It's the 21st century. Here we go. Um, So this is Sparkles and this is Marley. Um, These are two of my children's most favorite animals. Um, We're going to pretend, what's your name? Sam. Sam. We're going to pretend like Sparkles is Sam's heart. Okay. And we're going to pretend like Marley is Caleb's heart. Okay. Now, before (laughs) Sam and Caleb got married, (laughs) their hearts were their responsibility and it belonged to them. Now, um, Sam and Caleb, what I want you to do is come closer together. Okay. And what I want you to think about is when you do what? Not too close. No, well, you can get as close as you want. But um, <laughs> when you guys got married and when we get married, what do you do with your heart? Show me. Show me. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Now, um, show me number one. If you say, yeah, that's what my spouse and I did. And show me number two. If you say, no, that's not what we did. Show me right now. One is, yeah, uh, yeah, that's what we do with our hearts. Show me a two. If you say, no. Nope. Okay, now look. Who is now responsible for Caleb's heart? Sam. Who's now responsible for Sam's heart? Caleb. Now let's imagine, before they got married, flip it, okay? Um, Let's imagine that Sam really liked to do really crazy stuff, and he was out here, and sometimes he would shame himself, so he would step on his heart. Step on it, dude. Step on your heart. Yeah. 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 And then sometimes he'd pick it up, and sometimes he'd get real pouty, and so he'd pout, pout with your heart. There you go. He's pouting with his heart, right? And then sometimes Caleb, what Caleb would do is Caleb would get angry at his heart. Get angry at your heart, Caleb. Yeah, he's, he's, yo, yeah, there we go. (laughs) And when he was single, that's what he used to do. And he would just get so aggravated. And then he'd put it away and he'd hide it, put it in his pocket, put it in his pocket. I, would, I don't want people to see. Oh, he's even got cargo shorts on. Perfect. Yes. He's going to hide it because he doesn't want anybody to see it. 
right? But then now look what happens. If when they got married, oh no, how did you take care of your heart before you were married? There we go. But now, now who's he doing that with? Caleb's heart. And what is Caleb doing with Sam's heart? Hiding it. He's getting angry with it. Well, how do we think that makes Sam feel? That's a very therapy question, right? Well, how does that make Sam feel? This seems fairly irresponsible to me. Also, (laughs) fairly common in the context of marriage. We think that when we get married, this is supposed to happen. When in reality, who's responsible for our heart? Jesus. Jesus is responsible for our hearts. Not my spouse. If I do this, it's going to create problems. How could you? Why would you get so? Why are you getting so angry with me? Wouldn't you just relax? You're not supposed to get angry. Why are you treating my heart like that? I really wish you would not just stomp on my heart all the time. I can't believe you don't care about what I feel. None of us have ever said that, right? But you can see how this sets up a pretty dangerous situation. This is kind of the based definition of codependency. I need you to make me feel better. It's a very dangerous place to be. Especially considering how we most often treat our hearts in the first place. We don't always do it that way. We don't always destroy it or hurt it. But part of what we have to do is be able to get our heart. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> got to be able to get our heart back. We got to take it to Jesus. And then as Jesus completes it, offer it in completion. And it's at this point, right? Because sometimes what's going to happen, right? Um, Sparkles is going to be mean. She's going to splash water. She's going to. Sometimes it's going to happen. But then Sparkles is going to say, wait a second, I need to go back to Jesus. We got to get this right. And Marley's going to say, okay, I'll be here when you're ready. And they come back. And then they're good. They're connected. Their us is strong. And then Marley's probably going to get angry. And then they're going to go back, work it out with Jesus get complete again, and then come back. Under no circumstance, though, should we do this. Thank you very much. I was not anticipating two dudes. I appreciate it. Yeah, good job. Now, this is a really interesting thing. um, Because when we look at marriage and when we look at um, what is it that we're supposed to do, Um, There's two passages that I think are really interesting. Um, The first is, and you'll be very familiar with these passages. These are not new passages to you. Um, This passage in Mark that says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is a cool thing. um, Because if we look at this, and we're going to talk about this in about an hour. And when we look at these things, he tells us to love our God with four parts of ourselves. Our hearts, our soul, our minds, and our strength. That's what we should be doing is turning all of those aspects of ourselves to God. Now, there's an interesting thing also that I've learned as I've gone through this. Um, There's this passage in Luke 2. You'll also be fairly familiar with this passage. Um, And this passage in Luke 2 is kind of about how um, Jesus, it's that weird period of his life from where he got lost in the temple. And then all of a sudden, boom, he's like 30. Like, whoa, what happened? There's like 18 years. Like, where? what's going on there? Um, but part of what you, you, I didn't really notice this until I started doing this work. But there's this passage right here in Luke that's really interesting. And what it tells us that God was doing was that Jesus kept increasing in wisdom, stature, with God, and with man. So for 18 years, what we see Jesus doing is the very thing that he's telling us to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what was he doing? What was he doing in his transformational, his sanctificational, and his growth process? He was also doing the very thing he's called us to do. Which is one of the cool things about Jesus in the first place, right? Now, how do we, because that's part of what I want to talk about, is if we're going to get our marriages to line up with this, if we're going to take responsibility back for our own us And we're going to be responsible for our own hearts. What does that create? What's the goal? What's the end game? So if we're working towards something that we are intending to do differently in regards to marriage, there's two pillars. Get it? Those are supposed to be pillars. Thank you. There's two pillars that we're supposed to stack everything in our marriage on. 
And those two pillars create what I call marital stability or intimate foundation. So this is where if we have a hard time connecting with each other, this is what we got to come back to. And what's interesting is you need two things in marriage in order for it to work. Remember that us that was created, it needs food and it needs water. Think about, right, if it's going to be the first child of the marriage, we've got to feed it, and we've got to hydrate it. And in the context of marriage, food is love, and water is trust. Food, love itself, is pretty, um, like a cheeseburger is a cheeseburger. It's going to give you the amount of sustenance. It holds enough in that one thing to sustain you for a certain level or amount of time, and then you're going to need more of it. Right? So I'm going to eat a cheeseburger, and then in two or three hours, I'm going to be hungry again, and then I'm going to need something else. And then I'm going to take some time, and then I'm going to need something else. So if I'm feeding my marriage, it's ongoing. It doesn't stop. It's got to get love. It's got to get love, and it's got to be regular, and it's got to be consistent, because we don't want to get cranky. Right? You've probably heard the expression, hangry. as a thing. It's a real thing. Right? The other thing, and when we think about trust in a marriage... Trust is like water in the sense that it's fluid. It's fluid. So there's some give and take. Yes. You're okay. That's fine, right? So when we think about this idea of trust, this is also something that a lot of couples struggle with is, I want to be able to trust my spouse. We don't feel like there's any trust in the marriage. The marriage doesn't feel safe. Trust is a very fluid thing, just like water. So you got to be able to give it, and then you got to take it. It ebbs and it flows. It looks different depending on the situation or the context. But the consistency and the flow of marriage is what creates the trust. I kind of like to think about it like a rope sometimes. And that rope is either taken in or let out. I'm going to take in a little bit, and then I'm going to let out a little bit. I'm going to give more, and I'm going to get more. Yeah? And when we think about love, what we're talking about is the heart. Right? So you shall love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart. In the same way that Jesus was taking care of relationships. And when we look at, okay, how do I love? What does this look like in my marriage? How am I supposed to? What does this food look like in my marriage? When we talk about food and marriage, what we're talking about is nurturing others. I want to give. I want to be humble. I want to practice humility of my spouse, towards my spouse. So I want to take care of things for him or her. I want to show them that I'm, they're on my mind. I want to do things that are considerate. I want to grow. This is like the soil. I want the nutrients to grow things in the marriage. It's very practical things. The other thing that we need, um, so if you think about love, we're also talking about the mind. There's this really cool part of the brain we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but there's this part of our brain out here by our eyebrows. You've already tapped it today. It's called your prefrontal cortex or your frontal lobe. It's also what we call your mind and spirituality. We're the only creatures on the planet to have this part of our brain. Your dog does not have a prefrontal cortex. This is the part of your brain that lets you think about your thinking. This is the part of your brain that when you tap into spirituality, when you do your quiet times, when you feel the presence of God, when you are connected with Holy Spirit, when you're worshiping, that's the part of the brain that's engaged. Right? Your dog does not wonder, why am I licking my butt? <laughs> no, it just licks its butt. It doesn't think anything about it. It just goes on. Right? Your dog just barks. It doesn't think about why it's barking. It just responds. It's instinctual. All animals are like this. We're the only ones on the planet to have this capability. And so when we think about love, what we're talking about is taking care of that part of our brain. How am I feeding my mind? What am I putting in? Am I reading books? Am I meditating on scripture? Am I listening to music? Am I, um, that's healthy and positive. What is it that I'm putting into that part of my brain? In the same ways, um, like you might need some kind of a mentor. Like this is where we sit down with people. I always tell couples, like if you're going to get a mentor to help you foster this part of your brain, get somebody that is a season of life ahead of you. And that is in a good place from your perspective. Don't go hang out with your buddy that's also in the same year of marriage with the same age kids dealing with the same issues. Not going to be helpful for your mind. Right? So when we look at trust, how do we build trust in marriage? What we're talking about 
is the soul or this is the God. This is balance, give and take. Relationships are supposed to be balanced that are horizontal. So what this means is Caleb and Sam, they are at the same place. There is supposed to be a relational balance between the two of them. Mom and dad and kids are imbalanced. I am not expecting things from my kids. There's tr- I give and give and give to my children. I never take. And we're going to talk about how we do and how it messes things up. But we're not supposed to take. In my marriage, I'm supposed to do both. I give a little and I take a little. I give aspects of trust. I take aspects of trust. I need that in exchange. And when things are good, when we're moving and grooving, when the us is happy, it's balanced. A lot of times what happens um, when we get our work of fair recovery in the therapy room, there's an imbalance in the fairness, in the trust of the relationship. So, for example, um, if the offending spouse um, has offended for, let's say, four years, the scale is tipped in four years of imbalance. So the victim, the one who was offended against in therapy gets four years to imbalance that system back to where it should be balanced. What that means is, whoever the victim is, if we're looking at trust, they call the shots. You're going to tell me this. You're going to let me have access to this. We're going to do this. That's how we rebuild in that trust to balance things out in the relationship. If it's not balanced, it does not go well. Right? The last thing is strength. When we look at this, we're talking about stature or how God grew in stature as well as ourselves, how we grow in stature. Trust is this thing um, that is invisible. It's fluid and it's very, very complicated. Very, very complicated. You probably heard the expression, right? You lose trust in buckets and you gain it back in drops. That's a pretty common trust expression. Um, But when we look at how we are called to be in our marriage transformed, sanctified, and grown, we should be acting this way regardless. We should be acting this way regardless. Now, when things go well, you've got pretty strong structure here. You've got some columns. Yeah? Have a conversation at your table. What do you think about this? What questions do you have? Go. I know we're going to try to push questions. Uh, this can be kind of confusing. <laughs> uh, it's not uncommon to be a little confused or perplexed by this. Um, is there any like burning question that you're like, I really, I don't really want this explained, understood? Yeah. So her question is, how do you um, create stability um, without being too naggy or trying to be? Yeah, basically. Without being the Holy Spirit is what she said. How do you try not to be the Holy Spirit? Right. This is a really good example, and part of I. Remember, this is comprehensive or cumulative we're adding here. So part of what we have to come to is when I see my spouse not being trustworthy, when I feel like the stability is off, I got to look at my heart. This is where it gets confusing. I got to, okay, whoa, 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 what's going on for me? I do this all the time in therapy. Well, okay, great. Now, why don't you talk about you? Let's get you back over here. What's going on for me? So, for example, we'll just—I think you brought this up. Uh, it's a very common example in couples right now. Um, we're on our phones all the time. My spouse is on his or her phone all the time. I can't get them off of the phone. Okay, how does that affect you? Well, it makes me feel like they're not paying attention to me. Okay, what message do you get when people don't pay attention to you? Well, I must not be important. Okay, what do you do when you don't feel important? I get super naggy. Okay. Well, what does Jesus want to tell you about how you feel not important? You see, I go back to my heart. When I start looking at my spouse, it's like I've thrown sparkles or Marley the other direction. 
If you would just get off your phone, I'd feel my, like we were more connected. Right now, when we're working to create balance, right? Because on the other side of that, if I'm working to be trustworthy, I'm trying to be a safe space for my spouse to speak those things to me. You're right. I'm really sorry. Balance. I have been on my phone too much. How can we problem solve this? How can we make a decision around our technology use that's going to make us feel more connected? Boop. Right? Now, I make it sound real easy. Because <laughs> I'm not in your marriage. <laughs> and I'm standing up here just talking about it, right? But when it gets activated, it looks very different. And we're going to talk about that after lunch. We're going to talk about how do I, how do I handle this? How do I get back? How do I get, how do I take care of my heart? Even if my spouse is not taking care of his or her heart. And how do we still stay in that us spot? You can do it. There's a way to do it. And we'll get there. Great question. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> and what I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying going blind. I think um, the last I've heard, and you know what they say about statistics, right? Like, whatever. Um, but when we're at our best, when we are as trustworthy as we are capable of being, we're in a good place. We are loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're connected. Our us is good. We've been feeding it. We are about 80 to 83% trustworthy. 100% trustworthiness is not possible unless you are Jesus. No offense. You're not totally red. It's not, I'm not saying that you're not totally red people. I'm not saying that you're not trustworthy, but I don't, I, I have not seen it be conceivably possible to be 100% trustworthy. So that might free some stuff up in your marriage right there. That happens all the time. I can't trust him. Well, how much? I'm supposed to be able to trust him all the time. Whoa. Let, whoa. Not necessarily. If he's acting a fool, that's a different story. But if he's just trying the best he can, we're going to extend some grace. We're going to be humble about it. And we're going to balance that out as best we can. As best we can. Um, I also don't think we should trust other people 100% because people aren't trustworthy. That's not, a, that's not a wise way to live, right? I think we do this with our kids all the time, right? Stranger danger. That's for a reason. That's for a reason. Good question. I don't know if that answers your question. Ish. Yeah. And then as, as the marriage grows, as these, these things become more stable, remember these are the pillars of marital stability, so as these grow and strengthen, it will, continue, it will change with the evolution of your marriage. Absolutely it will. And if you think about this, right, I don't want to do a poll. I think there's all different um, what's the word? years of experience in marriage in the room, right? Some of us might not even be married. Some of us are married for multiple years, right? So where my wife and I were in year one is not where we are now in year eight. Because remember, we're growing. We're getting purified. We're getting sanctified. Things are changing. And if I look back and I'm like, huh, we've been married for five years. We've kind of been the same all five years. Whoop. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. How come? What's going on? Dysfunction can get very functional. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Respect is tricky. <laughs> um, there's some marriage uh, resource out there um, that harps on this in regards to, well, I can go there yet. Um, so her question was, how does respect work in regards to trust? Is that, was that your question? 
Yeah. Um, respect is one of these things um, that is... I'm trying to think about this. My, my gut answer <laughs> is I don't need my spouse to respect me to know that I am respectable. Um, that's where I get that from God. That's where I tap back into Jesus and I say, God, me and you, we're going to work this out. Um, and again, if my spouse is not being trustworthy as he or she should be, it's going to mess that up a little bit, right? So if my spouse is not is maybe emotionally or verbally abusing me, um, if my spouse is not being responsible on his or her end, it might set up there to be like this imbalance of respect. Um, I think all human beings are respectable, I think we should act as though we are. I think we should operate under the assumption that um, I'm going to respect you. And by respecting you, what that's going to look like is me living out these different aspects of our marriage to create it into a sense of stability. So, for example, like one of the things um, like I respect my wife in the ways um, is every almost every time I make a transition in my day, I let her know. She tracks my phone. She has access to everything that's going on with me. Um, not because I've ever had any kind of extramarital relationship or issue there, but because I want to respect her. I want to say, hey, listen, I want to build this trust in. I want you to know that here's where I am. Here's what I'm doing. I respect you in the same ways. She's putting that back in me as well. That's a really tough question. Respect. I'm going to have to think about that. Lots of guys tend to feel disrespected a lot. I'm thinking, sorry. Good. Other questions? This is the goal. Right? This is what you're gonna this is what we're gonna come back to over and over, right? So this is kind of um, the backbone to some of the, the practical things that we'll talk about as we go throughout today. Yeah. <coughs> um wait, oh my god. Uh, have a conversation at your table. Uh, there are four things that healthy marriages have. Um, talk at your table about what you think. What do you think those four things are? What do you think of those four things in a marriage are that create it to be a healthy space? Uh, what do we think? Communication, intimacy, trust, safety, submission. Nobody said it, but I'm going to put it sex, spirituality, grace. It's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> decision <laughs> decision making model good now I, I kind of got my car in front of my for, my horse um, right now what psychology is saying what marriage and family therapy is saying that marriages need um, we need non-sexual intimacy um, so this would be things like communication these are things like talking about more than just your business aspects of your marriage. So what are you doing? Where are you going? How long are you going to be there? What's our schedule look like today? This is like a heart check-in. Um, this is also non-sexual physical intimacy, hugs, kisses, hand-holding, those kinds of things. Um, that's one of the most important things. The second aspect of a marriage, in order for it to be healthy, is egalitarianism. Um, that's a fancy word for saying things being equal. Things being equal. Um, so um, we'll get to this later today, um, but there's a, an equality in the objective day-to-day -day maintenances of our lives. So, for example, doing laundry. It's not just one person's job or another person's job. Bathing the children. Not just one person's job or another person's job. Mowing the yard. Paying the bills. All of those kinds of things. There's supposed to be a balance there. It's supposed to be equal. And the third thing is quality time. So actually spending time together. Um, this is an important thing that it says quality time. 
Um, checking your Facebooks while you watch a Netflix, not quality time. Sorry. Sitting on the couch while you watch television, not quality time. Um, and I think this overwhelms couples a lot. Like, we don't have time. How the heck are we supposed to spend more time together? We don't have any time. Um, remember, your us um, needs food on a regular basis, but it's not every single day, right? So maybe, like, quality time is like a big um, fancy steak that it just needs every now and then. So it just needs some kind of carved out time. This can be as simple as um, a date on the back porch once we put the kids down to bed. This can be as simple as turning off things. Just turning it off. This might even be time at the table after dinner. We're not talking like huge, extravagant, like got to pencil it in. Maybe you do, but um, just some kind of quality time. Um, the, the next thing is sex or physical intimacy. Um, which is a pretty in, in, in interesting thing. And then the next thing you'll see is that these should be equal. They should be equal. Um, you've heard there are so many preachers and pastors and speakers that say lots of things like, women just need this. And men just need this. And women should be giving their husbands this. And husbands, you should be giving your wife this. And when we look up here, it's balanced. It's balanced. Sex is only 25% of overall marital satisfaction. So if you are a man or a woman who says, God, our marriage sucks because we don't have good sex. No, 25% of your marriage sucks. What's going on in the other 75%? (laughs) Right? Um, there's also, and part of what I was mentioning earlier with this, this lady's question back here, um, there's a very, very popular, and I'm probably going to step on some toes here, but remember, I told you I was going to be honest. It's a very popular book out that talks about how men just need respect and women just need love. I don't think that's healthy. <laughs> Um, I think that is a good thing to read and get information about, um, but I do not think that we are that specific. Um, We are, this is kind of an interesting thing, gestationally, so when we are conceived, man and woman is identical until about 13 to 16 weeks in utero. The same until it splits. That's remarkable. (laughs) That is not an accident. Our needs are far more balanced than things and people and society and culture wants us to think that they are. So again, right? Remember, this is cumulative. We're adding comprehensive. If our us is going to be healthy and we want the stability to be balanced between the food and the water, the love and the trust, it's equal. We tend to all of these parts. And you do this. You, all, you do all of these things. <laughs> Looking up there, you should be like, oh yeah, we do this. And oh yeah, we've done this before. And oh yeah, we do this. But part of what you should be thinking through is, and I'm about to give you some time to do this, <laughs> what are our percentages? Where, where are our percentages? And I'm going to actually have you write these numbers down. You might have some zeros. <laughs> you might have some 90s. Right? But see if you can have a conversation. I'm going to give you about two minutes. Talk with your spouse. See if we can come up with it. When you think about um, non-sexual intimacy, what percentage of your relationship do you feel like is focused towards that? When you think about things like egalitarianism, things being balanced, how balanced do you think you are? You should end up with 100. So if you need to get your phone out and do some math, go for it. Ready to go.
Uh, go ahead and draw those math skills to a close real quick. Um, now, here's there's lots of ways that this may have played out for you, right? So you may have some that you feel like, oh, we're like at a zero here. It's not happening. Or you may be super elevated. You may also not end up with 100%. So you may have ended up with like 70%. So you've got 30% that uh, you, I'm about to give you, I'm going to ask you to do one more, ask you to do one more thing here in just a second, but you should be thinking about where do we want to put that 30% or what is that 30%? So maybe 30% of your marriage is not hanging out together. Believe it or not, that happens. I'm going to go chill with my buddies. See ya. Girls night. Whatever. Like, if that's how some of that time is being allotted, maybe you need to have that conversation. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get real concrete. And I want you to come up with, in regards to these four aspects of your relationship, what is one thing in the next 10 days you can do to address that fourth of your marriage? So what can we do to increase our, non- our non-sexual intimacy? What is one thing we could do to um, change the percentage? Maybe you're really balanced. Way to go. So if you ended up with 20% across each, great. Awesome. Um, but come up with one very, very specific. So on quality time, don't say, spend more time together. That's not going to help you. right? That's not going to help you at all. So get really specific. Like Tuesday nights, turn off the TV. That's how we're going to spend time together. Um, uh, the way that we're going to have non-intimate or non-sexual intimacy before we go to bed on Mondays, we're going to talk about what's in our hearts and our heads. That's what I'm talking about. Get real specific. Okay. Take another two minutes. Ready to go. Okay, so as you kind of wrap up with your spouse, um, I want you to think about, because I'm about to, what I want you to do now is um, share one thing that you and your spouse feel like you could do in one of these areas to improve it with everybody at the table. So you might have, they might have something that you don't have. Um, you probably want to steer clear, maybe not, but maybe you want to steer clear of like the whole sex thing. Like <laughs> maybe you do, I don't know. Maybe that could be helpful, right? Um, but have a conversation about that. The other question that um, Ramona kind of brought up was if we think about like, there's only 24 hours in a day, right? And if I'm at work for eight to 10 of those hours, and then we put the kids, you see what I'm saying? Like we're, we're just talking about as a whole, like if you think about, I, the way I think about these is like in an average week. About a seven to 10 day period. That's why I said, <laughs> pick one concrete thing in the next 10 days that you can do. So in about an average week, we should be hitting on these in certain ways. That's what that should look like. Yeah? So share out. I'll give you about a minute and then we'll go from there. So go ahead and go ahead and wrap up. Uh, anybody that feels comfortable um, with something that you came up with, or that somebody at your